Yeah. Good morning. Let's make a start. Well, welcome to St. John's in New Malden. It's lovely to see everybody here. Um, welcome to you if you're joining us online as well. It's lovely to be with everybody. Um, a special welcome. We've got little Ashley here today who's going to be baptised later in the service. So welcome to Karen and Ollie. Welcome to all the friends and family who've come with you as well. Um, since we've got people new in the church, just a few housekeeping things. Um, we are all wearing masks as we sit down and as we stand to sing and move around as well, just to keep each other safe. So thank you for doing that. Um, if you need the loos, do head out the back of church into the lounge and it's the second and third doors on your left. And um, if you've got little ones with you and they need something to play with, um, feel free to stay as part of the service and sit on the sofas at the back and there are toys there that the little ones can play with. In 10 or 15 minutes or so, the children and young people will go out to their activities and um, obviously I'll let you know when that happens and, and everyone who wants to do that is welcome to do that. So, welcome. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you who, who I am. That's what I was told. Um, I'm Catherine. I'm a member of the con congregation. Um, that ties in quite nicely because our series for these few weeks is we are thinking about who are you or who am I? And Matt's going to be talking to us today on um, In Christ, I Am Forgiven. So Matt will be speaking later. Lovely. That's all the practicalities out of the way. Let's just stop and pray um, as we go into the service. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we've come from our busy lives, from all the joys of this week, the highs, and from all the lows of this week as well. Lord, just help us now to put them behind us and focus on you. Father, still our hearts and minds, we pray. And help us to turn our eyes to you. Thank you that you are a God who wants to meet us just as we are. And we come into your presence now to worship you. And bring, come closer to you. And we pray that you'll do that and send your Holy Spirit to help us with that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to sing now. Um, do stand if you're able and do join us at home. We're going to stand and sing the splendour of the King.
Please do be seated. Every week we do things that we're not proud of or that where we fall short. Let's just take a few minutes um, to say the confession, to confess those things to God. It'll come up on the screen. We're going to say together the words in yellow and then there'll be some words in white that I'll say at the end. Let's say together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as forgiven people, we're going to sing again. Should we stand? Oh, <laughs> thank you.
please do take a seat. And we come to a very exciting part of our service now is uh, this morning we are going to baptise Ashley. So first of all, can I just invite Karen and Ollie and Ashley. Pe uh, good parents, you'll join us in a minute as well. But first of all, let's have... Now, Karen and Ollie and Ashley will be familiar to all of our regular people here from on a screen. <laughs> but we may not have met you in person before. Um, tell us first of all where you live. Uh, we live in Welling, down in Kent, so about an hour away. So how on earth did you come to be sort of part of the St John's family? You can take your mask off if you want to. <laughs> okay. Uh, so mainly because of Matt, I suppose. It's Matt's fault. Um, essentially, Matt and I worked together 25 years ago. 25 years ago. Um, and we hadn't connected for about 17 of them. Um, but I just kept seeing Matt's posts come up on, uh, on, the, on Facebook. And um, during the pandemic, we were stuck at home. We didn't do much. And therefore, we started watching the services online. And looking at Matt's services, we then reconnected. And they could say that's history, I suppose. <laughs> Brilliant. And you guys did Alpha with us, didn't you? Which was an absolute joy. Everything was on Zoom, of course. So um, you joined us. Can, uh, can you tell us in 20 seconds um, your experience of doing Alpha? I don't know. Um, it was really nice to connect with like-minded people who were full of questions. And actually, sometimes you didn't want to ask the questions, but other people did, and you got the answer that you wanted. <laughs> Um, and I suppose we asked questions that probably other people wanted to know the answer to and didn't feel right to answer or ask, sorry. Um, so yeah, it was really nice just to be able to share with like-minded people and learn about God together. Yeah. And especially for Ollie and I, to, um, it's our first time kind of as a couple exploring it as well, so that was really nice to do it together. And then this little one turned up halfway through the course. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say to anyone thinking about doing Alpha at the moment? Shameless plug, this is. <laughs> If you've got questions, and I had lots of questions, um, oh, hello, then it's brilliant to explore it and to talk to other people. It's not about being told things, it's about exploring it together. Wonderful. So we had, yeah, such a great time. And then you sort of joined our church, really, didn't you? In lockdown, you started serving, you were sort of helping us with technical stuff and all kinds of things. Uh, and it has been absolute joy to have you and, and Ashley too. So this morning, we are baptizing Ashley into our faith. It, you, we're saying, Ashley, you are part of this wonderful, crazy family uh, that knows and loves and tries to follow Jesus. Um, and we're praying as we baptize you that there will never need to be a time in your life that you can't know Jesus um, and follow him and love him. And that will change what that looks like as you get older. Yeah. But we want to welcome you to this family and celebrate God's work throughout your life. That's what we're praying for. So can I invite the godparents now to join, join us up the front as well? Now all the words that we're going to need for this are, are going to be on the screen, hopefully. Why don't you come and stand um, this side of me? I should get the, the baptism. Brilliant. So if um, we all join in with the bits in yellow, okay? If it's in yellow, it's for everybody. So faith is the gift of God to his people. In baptism, the Lord is adding to our number those whom he is calling. People of God, will you welcome Ashley and uphold her in her new life in Christ? With the help of God, we will. So now this is for parents and for godparents. Parents and godparents, the church receives Ashley today with joy. And today we're trusting God for her growth in faith. Will you pray for her and draw her by your example into the community of faith and walk with her in the way of Christ? In baptism, Ashley begins her journey of faith. But today you're speaking for her. So will you care for her? 
and help her to take her place within the life and worship of Christ's church. Fantastic. So, as we baptize Ashley into this faith, we're going to remind ourselves what it means to follow Jesus. And part of what it means, and we're going to be thinking about this later in the service as well, is, is to repent of all the stuff that stands in the way um, between us and God. Because as we've just sung and as we're going to be hearing, Jesus died and rose again so that we could know his forgiveness, so that we could be free to walk with Jesus. And that's what we're praying that you will be able to do as you grow up, Ashley. So parents and godparents, in baptism, God calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. So therefore, I'm asking you as parents and godparents, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? And do you turn to Christ as savior? Do you submit to Christ as Lord? Do you come to Christ the way, the truth, and the life? Wonderful. So, Ashley, I'm going... That's going to fall in the water, isn't it? Thank you. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Ashley, I'm going to sign you now with the sign of the cross. Okay. Can we have the next words up on the screen? Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of his cross and do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. And now we all say together, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world and the devil and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. Amen. So now we're all going to say the creeds together. Um, shall I uh, invite us all to stand if you're able for this part? We're going to declare that we believe in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is how we know uh, God, how he's revealed himself to us. So brothers and sisters, I ask you to profess together with Ashley the faith of the church. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you please take a seat again. Ashley Ann Wade. We're going to say a prayer for you. So, Lord God, we want to thank you today for Ashley, for the gift that she is to her mum and her dad and her family and her friends. And we want to thank you uh, for the work you've done in Karen and Ollie's life over the last couple of years. And thank you that this is a family who want to know and love and serve you. And we pray that as Ashley grows up, she will always know that she is loved by you that you walk with her, and that as she gets older, she will understand more and more of what it means to follow you uh, and to, to know your plans and purposes for her life. So would you bless her? In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. So, this is the last bit now, Ashley, where we welcome you to our crazy family, okay? And you, you can keep that if you like. You, you clearly like that bit of paper. So, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Ashley, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. So, we welcome you into the fellowship of faith. We are children of the same Heavenly Father. We welcome you. Fantastic. Ooh. Now, I've got various things to give you here. I'm going to give these to your mum. There's a, a lovely Bible there that I hope your mum and daddy are going to read to you. Um, and it's going to tell you all about Jesus so you can find out about how fabulous he is as you grow up. And then we're also going to give you a lighted candle. And I think David's got some matches. <laughs> Fantastic. One of the things, actually, that Jesus said about himself is that he's the light of the world. And then he told us as his disciples that we are little lights in the world as well, okay? So <laughs> you like that, don't you? I'm going to give that to your mum again, not to you, probably. <laughs> but I hope that this is going to remind you that you're called to shine God's light where you go. So again, if we could have the next words. God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and has given us a place with the saints in light. You've received the light of Christ. So walk in this light all the days of your life. Shine as a light in the world to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, please take a seat. Thank you very much. Well done, Ashley. Lovely. Um, we're going to have notices, as all churches do, to tell you what's going on in the week. Um, most notices are on our email, and if you don't get the email, um, then do talk to one of us and ask to be added to the email list, or email us at admin at sjnm.org. SJNM obviously stands for St. John's New Malden, so admin at sjnm.org will add you to the list. Um, but you'd just like to highlight something, wouldn't you, Isles? Yes, um, just a quick final plug for our Alpha course, which is starting, it's moved. So I know we were saying Alpha was going to be running on Wednesday evenings, uh, but we had a number of people who were interested in doing Alpha and couldn't make Wednesday nights, but they could make Sunday nights, and all the people who'd already signed up could do Sunday nights as well. So Alpha is now going to be on Sunday evenings, starting next Sunday, okay? And it's a chance to come and have some food together, uh, and ask any question you have about life, about the Christian faith, about who on earth is this God um, that, that Christians worship, who is Jesus. Um, and we sit and we, we watch a short film and then we just talk about who Jesus is and what it means to, um, to know him and love him and follow him. Uh, and anyone's very warmly welcome. So chat to um, me or Matt um, after the service, if you want to know more, there's quite a few people here today who did the last Alpha course. So if, I'm sure if you want to ask them, oh, look, they're waving as well. So I'm sure if you want to ask them what it's really like, you could go and chat to one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Right, in half a minute, um, our children and young people's activities will start and they can go out. So let's just pray for them. Father God, thank you for the blessing of little ones and all the children and young people. We thank you for their leaders and all they're doing to help the younger ones learn about you. We just pray now as they go that they'll have lots of fun and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you do have little ones and they'd like to, to go off to the back, you'll see the leaders and they can tell you which group they'll be happiest in. I'm going to just give you a minute to all, all move. Lovely, and then Mac, in a minute, you're going to come up and bring us our reading, which will come up on the screen. It's 
It's all right, I'll just let people go around. They're going everywhere at the moment. There's young people going that way, young people going upstairs. There's a lot of young people, it's great. Right, though, the reading this morning is taken from 1 John 1, and it's verses uh, 5 to 10. And it's, in, its title is Walking in the Light. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Shall we pray together? Thank you, God, for this uh, wonderful, joyful day. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate um, Ashley uh, with uh, Ollie and Karen and the rest of family and friends. Um, thank you that you love each one of us from the youngest to the oldest. And I pray now that you would speak to us about your love. Amen. So if we haven't met before, uh, my name is Matt. Um, I'm uh, Ours is the vicar here, Ours is husband. And today I'm going to be continuing a series of talks that we recently started here at St. John's looking at our identity, um, as you've, you've, you've already heard so far. Um, so you probably noticed the last couple of years um, in life have been pretty turbulent, to say the least. And when everything gets kind of turned upside down, as it has been through the pandemic, it can really affect our sense of who we are. So uh, Ours was talking about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, we often get our sense of identity from what we do, you know, whether that's, that's paid work or, or volunteering or caring for others, whatever it is. Or, or perhaps we can get a sense of identity from our relationships with friends, with family. And all of those things have, of course, been negatively affected one way or another in these last couple of years. And that is why we're doing this series of talks now. So as our own sense of identity might have got shaken, well, what does God say about us? Who does he say we are? For those of us who follow Jesus today, what does it mean for us to root our identity in him? And this week, uh, as I think uh, Catherine mentioned earlier on, the title is, In Christ I Am Forgiven which uh, yeah, sounds good, I guess. It does also raise some questions. Now, I've, I've been forgiven for what? <laughs> um, and, and why? And how? And actually, what difference does it make? There are lots of questions about being forgiven there. But we can start answering that, that first question, you know, what, what are we being forgiven for? When we consider probably the most prayed prayer in the world today is the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. We call it the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be using it later on in our service. And there is a line in that prayer that says, forgive us our sins. In fact, I don't know whether you've noticed, but sin has actually got quite a few mentions in the service so far today. Earlier on, um, Catherine led us in a confession that started with these words. It said, Lord God, we have sinned. 
Uh, Ollie and Karen and uh, Ashley's godparents stood up here just a moment ago, and they were asked by Isles, do you repent of your sins? They said yes, which is good. And our, our reading was pretty uncompromising, wasn't it? Verse 8 of what Mac just read to us says this. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And then just in case you missed it the first time, two verses later, John, the author, says exactly the same thing again. If we claim we've not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. Whew. I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, I wonder whether it's too late to put another red line on the lateral flow test that I did this morning. I mean, it's, it's, this is heavy stuff, isn't it? Sin, sin is a really religious word, isn't it? it? It doesn't typically get used outside of a church, except maybe by shouty people on street corners who are waving sort of vaguely threatening signs at passers-by. You know, what, what does the word sin even mean? Why do we need to be forgiven for it? Uh, Oz and I uh, have two children, and um, the oldest is four. And if you were to ask him what he thinks sin is, what would be his definition, he probably would say something like uh, making bad choices. Now, he's pretty self-aware, actually, and sometimes when he's got a bit overexcited, which is another way of saying throwing a screaming tantrum, um, he, he, says, he says, I can't stop making bad choices. And I'm just thinking, well, yeah, you and me both. Um, and then sometimes he says, you know, when I'm a grown-up, it means I won't make any bad choices. And I'm just like, ah, oh, I have some bad news for you. But, um, and it's not a bad definition of sin, is it? Making bad choices. But we can go deeper than that. Now, if you've ever heard anyone talking in church about sin previously, you may well have heard this. But you see, the word sin originally means to miss the mark. So imagine someone aiming an arrow or a spear at a target, but then they don't go sort of slightly off-center. They, they miss the target entirely. And, and that is called a sin. You know, and it, it, that kind of makes sense of the word, doesn't it? You know, I, I was aiming for financial integrity, but then I just massaged a few figures on my tax return, and I missed the mark. That is a hypothetical example, just in case anyone from the Inland Revenue happens to be watching our live stream today. <laughs> I was aiming for honesty and truthfulness, but then I made some bad choices. I missed the mark. I told some lies. I was planning on going to a work meeting with my notepad and my laptop, but I accidentally turned up with a suitcase full of wine instead. I missed the mark. Or did I miss the mark? Well, there's the question. Um, honestly, the only person who can genuinely claim to be turning up to a work meeting with wine is when a vicar is taking someone home communion, and that's that. Anyway, but that definition of sin does help us understand it a little bit better. And if we're really honest, it's something that probably resonates with all of us. But there is a deeper meaning still, and we can find that if we go back very near the very beginning of the Bible to Genesis chapter 3. And in this chapter, we read the story of Adam and Eve, and they're living in paradise in the Garden of Eden, but then they're interrupted by a crafty serpent. Now, I should say at this point, any question of was there literally a talking snake in the Garden of Eden is entirely missing the point. That's not what this story is about. The point is that this is the temptation that was put to Adam and Eve. You see that fruit on the tree that God specifically told you not to eat? Well, he doesn't want you to eat it because when you do, you will become like God. And that is sin right there. Or if you like, it's the sin beneath all sin, putting ourselves in the place of God, making our own rules rather than following His ways, and even then still breaking the rules that we made when we feel like it. You know, indulging our 
greed, indulging our selfishness as we please, or, 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 or judging others, condemning them for their faults, you know, even as we might try and excuse our own. Now, this might just be me, but if I make a mistake when I'm driving, it's because the light wasn't good, or it's because the road signs were wrong. There's a reason, there's a very good reason that I made a mistake when I'm driving. If you make a mistake when you're driving, it's because you're an idiot. Sin is ultimately putting ourselves in the place of God, and it's what leads to dictatorships and bullying and war and lying and abuse. You know, it's why the world is sort of on the edge of catastrophic climate change, because we've created a system where fulfilling our own desires and wants is more important than anything else. Sin is putting ourselves in the place of God, and when we do that, which to be honest, we all do, it inevitably leads to pain and suffering and brokenness and sorrow. That's the bad news. The really bad news is what sin then leads to. So after Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the Garden of Eden, they became separated from God. They were cut off from the source of life, and for the first time in their lives, they were ashamed. The story goes that they hastily sort of tried to sew some fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. They hid themselves from God because they were ashamed. I don't know if anybody has an experience like this. It's funny, you know, Ollie saying that we um, you know, knew each other from 25 years back. It's funny the things that stick in your mind. From even further back than that, I remember at primary school, I'd been with a friend, uh, and we were in, in the school building at lunchtime, and everybody else was sort of outside. I don't really know why we're, we were there, but he, he stole something from another pupil. And this was discovered, um, and, and the teacher, our class teacher, was incandescent, and she was, she was having a go at everybody. I was like, you know, if we find out who's done this, you know, they're going to get expelled and all the rest of it. And I, and I was like, I don't want to get expelled. And I put my hand up, and I, I confessed. And the sense of shame, you know the saying, to burn with shame? I mean, I was on fire, and it hadn't even actually been me. Now, according to psychologists, guilt and shame are different. You see, guilt says, I did a bad thing. Shame says, I am a bad person. And shame can be the result of other people's judgment on us, like for me, sitting in that primary school classroom. Or shame can be self-inflicted. It can be a judgment we make about ourselves. Many, many people, even outwardly very successful people, carry a deep sense of shame within them. Perhaps the result of having a parent who it felt impossible to please. Perhaps just from one cutting remark made by a teacher when they were an impressionable teenager. Perhaps from an experience of abuse. Shame has many causes, but it has one result, and that is that like Adam and Eve, we hide we either hide ourselves or we hide part of ourselves away. Now, I don't know um, if you've ever seen anything from uh, a website called dogshaming.com. Um, you might have seen various sort of memes posted up on Facebook. If we can have a couple of examples of this uh, up on the screen. Um, here we go. Now, just in case you can't read that, the dog on the left, so this, this is a thing. This is a thing that dog owners do. So the dog on the left has a sign there that says, I ate the toilet paper during a pandemic. <laughs> it's not a popular dog. And, and the dog on the left says, uh, I like the taste of Samsung remote controls. This second one tasted even better than the first one. <laughs> Marv, so got one more. Yeah, and this one says, I was sick on the lounge carpet when mum and dad were at church, and then I ate it. And just in case you've not met him, that is our dog. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can take that off the screen now. Thank you. He's called Oscar. He's mostly lovely. Um, now, now, but when you do this to a dog, it's pretty funny, because actually, they don't care. I put that sign up, you know, with Oscar last night, and he wasn't like, oh, I'm so ashamed. You know, he's a dog. But we do this to people, don't we? More than ever now on social media, you know, like shaming people on, 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 on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, it, the opportunities for doing it are pretty much 
limitless. And we do this to ourselves because we can't stop putting ourselves in the place of God and standing in judgment over others, standing in judgment over ourselves. So that's the bad news and the really bad news. You know, we sin. We all do. We, exactly like our Bible reading said, we make bad choices. We miss the mark. We put ourselves in the place of God. And then we suffer shame as a result. But, but then, in our reading, we also heard this. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. And I just want to to briefly look at one incident in Jesus' life that illustrates how is this possible? How does God deal with our sin and our shame? How does he forgive us? How does he make us pure and righteous? Well, this incident is recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 8. What happened was Jesus was teaching his followers And then some religious leaders of the day, they were called the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they brought to Jesus a woman who had been caught committing adultery. Now, if these so-called religious leaders actually cared about the law and what was right and wrong, they would have brought both the man and the woman because clearly you can't commit adultery on your own. And the law said that they were both responsible. But it kind of seems, you know, they've, they've they've let the man go. And they've just dragged the woman to Jesus' feet because actually they are just looking for a way to trap Jesus. Because, you see, the Jewish law said that adultery was punishable by death. And if Jesus agreed with the law, then he would be in serious trouble with the Roman authorities who were in charge at the time because they alone could um, administer the death penalty. On the other hand, if Jesus disregarded the Jewish law and said, just let her go, let her go, those religious leaders could say, ah, he's a, he's a, he's a blasphemer. He, he's not to be trusted. He doesn't follow our laws. So they think they've caught Jesus. They think they've caught him in this dilemma. Much worse, of course, though, is the woman's situation. She has been caught in the act of adultery. She's probably not fully dressed. And like Adam and Eve in the garden, maybe she's kind of clutching her, her robe to, to preserve what remains of her modesty. She's probably bruised. She's probably grazed from the rough handling that she's received. She's there on the floor, surrounded by angry men who are threatening to stone her to death. As I was uh, doing a bit of reading um, for this talk, I, I came across an article on the website of Scientific American magazine. It said this, shame is the uncomfortable sensation we feel in the pit of our stomach when it seems we have no safe haven from the judging gaze of others. We feel small and bad about ourselves, and we wish we could vanish. And that is probably barely scratching the surface of how this woman feels. She is utterly humiliated. She's utterly terrified. She's utterly shamed. So what does Jesus do? The story says, he bends down and he writes in the dust on the ground with his finger. Now, there's been lots of speculation about what could it be that Jesus thought was so important to write in the dust on the town. You know, it probably wasn't his shopping list. You know, maybe he was writing down the names of other women who these religious leaders had had affairs with. Maybe he was writing down um, details of other sins that they had committed. Well, we don't know. But what we do know, though, is that Jesus, in the gentlest and most non-confrontational way possible, was drawing all of this hostile attention away from the woman and onto himself. Because that is what he does. And then after everybody's, you know, kind of gathering around, look, look, what, what's he, what is he doing? What is he doing? And then he stands up and he says, let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he kneels down again and he carries on writing. And there's silence. And then there's an uneasy shuffling of the feet and maybe a, a few nervous coughs. And then there's the sound, one after another, of stones just falling to the ground as the men who are holding them realize that they have been beaten. The judgment they wanted to cast on the woman has come back at them, and they walk away. 
all of them. Until there's no one left except Jesus and the woman. Has no one condemned you? He asks. No one, sir, she answers. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus replies. Go and leave your life of sin. And those words, neither do I condemn you, they speak deeply into the sin and shame that is located somewhere in every human heart. Now, this is the only place in the Bible that Jesus spoke that exact phrase, but we see him effectively saying it over and over and over again throughout his life on earth. Uh, Jesus met with a man called Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He was a traitor. He was a cheat, and he was a thief. And instead of pronouncing judgment on him, Jesus said, I am coming to your house for tea because I do not condemn you. There's another occasion, a prostitute gate crashes a social occasion. She makes this incredible scene, sobbing and weeping all over Jesus' feet. And instead of recoiling in horror, Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven, go in peace, because I do not condemn you. When Jesus was being crucified, there were two men next to him being executed for their crimes. One of them called out to Jesus for mercy, and Jesus responded saying, Today you'll be with me in paradise because I don't condemn you being executed for your crimes. You're still not condemned. Jesus even refused to condemn the soldiers who'd hammered nails through his wrists and feet. And instead he prayed, Father, forgive them. You see, Adam and Eve sinned by wanting to put themselves in the place of God, and that led them to a place of shame. But Jesus flips that. He reverses it. He turns it on his head because he was and is God, but he gave that up for us, for love. He left heaven to be born as a poor peasant baby lying in an animal's feeding trough, and then he died on the cross in a place of utter shame and humiliation, stripped naked by the Roman soldiers who crucified him. When Jesus was confronted with the woman caught in adultery, he drew the hostility of the crowd onto himself. And on the cross, he did that on a cosmic scale because all of our sin, all of our shame was placed on him. All the world's brokenness and pain and wrong was given to him like a cup filled with the bitterest drink. And he drank every last drop and he said, it is finished and he breathed his last. Jesus is the one who stands in the way of judgment, the one who covers our sense of shame, the one who says, neither do I condemn you, and he's the one who God raised to life again so we could know life and forgiveness in him. So our reading says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. But we need to understand when we read that it's not like we have to confess like God is grudgingly giving his forgiveness, although he doesn't really want to. Jesus has already done everything necessary for us to be forgiven, and we simply need to accept that. You might be someone who struggles every day with making bad choices. You might be someone who really struggles to think of anything you've done really wrong to confess to God, but maybe you wrestle with a sense of shame that no one really knows about because you still don't think you're good enough or successful enough in some way. Well, hear these words again. Neither do I condemn you. That's what Jesus says to each one of us. He gave up heaven to take our sin, to take our shame, and to make it possible for us to live our lives in the light of this truth, that in Christ I am forgiven. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Um, Really helpful to hear about missing the mark, because we all know what shame feels like. But um, let's just remember what Jesus has done and the forgiveness he brings. Should we just take 30 seconds maybe to close our eyes and just think and pray about what that means for us?
Thank you, Lord, that we can confess our sins to you. And through Jesus, we are forgiven. Amen. And it's time to sing now. Thank you, band. Shall we stand together? We're going to sing as we celebrate the fact that we are forgiven. Is who you say we are and we we pray in this moment Lord that if that is something we struggle to believe that you by your Holy Spirit would help us that you would speak that truth deep into our hearts today Lord would we know that we are forgiven and set free and loved as your children Amen. Please do be seated and we're going to continue in prayer now. Uh, Linda's going to come up and lead us in prayer.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we, we come to the part of our service that we call prayers of intercession, which is rather a long word, isn't it? But it means that we bring to God things that are on our hearts, the um, issues that we, or some of the issues that we worry about. So let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you and bring our requests because you have told us to do so. Thank you for all your love and goodness towards us, which we take so much for granted. We look around our world and see so much that concerns us. For the people of Tonga in the South Pacific, following the volcanic eruption and the tsunami, as the true extent of the damage is only starting to be known now. Thank you for the aid being, spent to the pe being sent to the people at this time. We pray for those who have lost their homes and possessions as a result of this disaster. Lord, hear our prayer. We bring the fighting in the Yemen to you between rebel groups and the coalition led by Saudi Arabia. An airstrike on a detention centre has killed more than 70 people recently. We pray there will not be any further escalation in the fighting and that talks will take place to bring about peace and stability. Lord, hear our prayer. The news headlines are full of the situation on the border of Ukraine where there has been a build-up of Russian forces. We ask that the current tension will not result in fighting and loss of life. Lord, hear our prayer. We bring our own country to you at this time when restrictions associated with the pandemic are coming to an end. We remember all those who work in the NHS as they continue to face pressure. May those who feel tired and overwhelmed have their strength renewed. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in positions of authority in this country. There are so many rumours circulating at the present time, and we pray that you will guide all those involved. Here at St John's, we ask you will bless us as we serve you in our local community through the various activities. As we start a new week, please help us in our words and actions to give honour to you. Amen. Sorry, <laughs> we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together now, which will come up on the screen, I hope. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Linda, for leading our prayers. Uh, we're going to sing now. Um, thank you, band. And as we've just been saying, everyone needs compassion.
for a final prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our Saviour, who is mighty to save, you know that as we go out into the week and we're human, we will miss the mark. Lord, we thank you that we can confess our sins to you and you, through what you've done on the cross, will forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for doing all that for us. Thank you for your love. We pray that as we go out, we'll know that love and we'll be able to share it with others and be a little like Ashley's candle, shining your light in the world this week. So we ask your blessing on each of us as we go out this week, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That brings us to the end of our service. Um, Sorry we're not doing tea and coffee at the moment, um, but it is lovely to be with you, and we do hope to see you all again soon, and bye-bye at home as well. Bye-bye.